So can neck problems actually cause autonomic symptoms? This is a really important question, um, honestly, because it's one that doesn't get talked about very much, even though it's very prevalent out in the community. So thank you to Marianne and to Tina for delivering the question, and hopefully we can do it justice. Um, if, by the way, if you don't know me, my name is Dr. Nathan Kaiser. I'm a chiropractic neurologist, and I help people with long-term concussion and autonomic symptoms get better. So you can see why uh, this is really important to the work that I do, because these are the people I see every single day. So back to the question, it's a good one. How does, how does your neck, problems with or injuries relative to your neck actually contribute to autonomic symptoms? And the place that we have to start on that is, is understanding like, what kind of autonomic symptoms are they? So people that have neck problems, typically have symptoms that are related to blood flow to their brain. So lack of blood flow to their brain, we tend to see symptoms like dizziness, nausea, lightheadedness, brain fog, difficulty with like highly sensory environments, things like that, you know, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, a lot of movement. They tend to make people feel overwhelmed easy or feel anxious. They tend to be anxious or depressed kind of back and forth. Um, so there's like a huge, a large cohort of things that are associated with injuries in the neck and injuries with changes in blood flow to the brain and they overlap. So the question, next question would be like, well, how does your neck influence blood flow? Which is a really good question. The first thing you might run to is saying like, well, maybe there's something twisted around in there and it's preventing blood from getting up. That can be the case sometimes, but that's not really what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is more relative to the fact that the symptoms people have are twofold. Number one, they can be related to the actual injury within their neck. These things cause pain, like we talked about with dizziness, disorientation, they can make your eyes feel like they're, um, like your vision's blurry. It can also feel like your eyes are, are kind of moving on you, like you're, like you're on a boat or like there's tension in your eyes as well. And then that overlaps with the symptoms that people experience around not having blood flow. But they both come back to this idea of proprioception in the spinal system, particularly within the neck, because of the high mobility in the neck. And the fact that a lot of times when we have injuries, they're relative to getting your head and your neck kind of jerked around, whether that's in a sports-related injury or in a car accident. Usually your neck sustains the brunt of, of the movement. So if we kind of move back again, and I backpedal a little bit, we can think about, all right, well, how does that proprioception, that, that sense of where we are in space, coming from receptors in our joints and our muscles and our tendons, how does that relate to blood flow to the head? And this was actually answered really well um, by a gentleman named Bill Yates in a paper that was written in 2014. And what he figured out, he was really interested in looking at, hey, how is how does the vestibular system interact specifically with reflexes of the vasoconstrictor system of the autonomic system? So this is particularly related to how blood flow is sent from the heart around the body and up to the head. He was looking at this because looking at cats and dogs and rats and tigers, that system set up one way because we have a heart that is on the same level as your head. So the machinery that you need to be able to sense where your head is is less important. But in people, we tend to operate with our head above our heart, which means we have to have a second layer of machinery built into our nervous system that helps us to be able to constrict the blood vessels to increase pressure so that we can push blood up the tubes into our brain, right? Just the same way as if you had a garden hose and you were trying to like spray the water a little bit further, you could put your thumb over the nozzle. When you put your thumb over it, it makes the tube smaller. And that smaller tube means you're gonna have increased resistance and more pressure to be able to push that, that fluid further. And the same thing is what happens when we, when we look in our own blood vessels. So when we detect that our head is above our heart, we get a signal, a reflex, that comes down and signals the muscle vasoconstrictors in our system to constrict and increase pressure 
and return it up toward our head, which is a super cool, it's like a really cool mechanism. And the fact that we have that is great. But because it's an extra layer of machinery, it means that we have to have sensors to be able to control it, and it's got to be able to operate um, without having any errors. Otherwise, we see an interruption in blood flow to our head when we stand up. Okay. So, Yates was looking at this and saying, okay, this, this vestibular system tells us where our head is in space, which is perfect. So, the vestibular system, actually, when we do studies and we manipulate the vestibular system, we get a reaction from the blood vessels. So there's a reflex that ties the two together. But what he realized was the vestibular system tells us where our head is. But it doesn't tell us where our head is relative to our body, and that's really what we need to be able to know if it needs more blood, if we have to increase the pressure. So he said there has to be, we also have to look at these other integrated sensors that help us tell to help us link together where our head is relative to where our heart is or our body. And what he put together was this realization that you really have this linkage from your neck and then your, your spinal joints and musculature that help us to fill out that picture and to fill out that reflex. So if we, if we take out the information from the neck, it impairs the ability of the vestibular system to interact with the vascular system. So you see that there's this, it's not as simple as like, where's my head? Here it is. Here's where the blood flow goes. It takes information from all of these systems together, and that creates a picture that allows us to control the blood flow. Beautiful stuff. So then that makes it kind of easier to see that if we injure our neck, if we change the sensory information, from the joints in our neck or from the muscles in our neck, or if we change the way we move, which changes the feedback from those systems, right? So if I got a stiff neck, or if when I try to turn my head, I kind of have to do this or move my body, right? These kinds of things that you've seen, those things are gonna change the picture of what our head and body relationship looks like, therefore changing the integrated reflex of the vasoconstrictor system. What that means, we get less blood flow to our head. So we want to be able to look at things and help us understand the relationship of how is the vestibular system working? How is our visual system working related to that? And then how does our proprio-spinal system work related to those other two programs to be able to give us a bigger picture of vascular activity? The way we do this clinically, we look at Active ranges of motion, simple. Like, can you move your neck? Does your neck have normal feeling and sensation? Um, do you get dizzy or nauseous just from moving your neck by itself? Can you coordinate movements with your eyes and your head and your neck together? Or when you move your head, do we get heart rate changes? Or do we measure changes in blood flow velocity just from activating those systems? So if we put all those things together in a line, it helps to fill that out so we can understand if it's a problem specific to the neck or in the inner ear or in the visual system or in how they're all integrated together and then we have to kind of incorporate all of them. So being able to look at it that way is super useful, especially if you've got neck pain, if you've got dizziness, if you've got visual problems and you're experiencing autonomic problems. Because if I want to retrain a portion of the brain, let's say I want to retrain visual acuity, to be able to like use my eyes better, to be able to control the movement of my eyes better. The rehab that we have to do is in the cells and the neurons within the brain. So if we're going to exercise them, we have to be able to get oxygen to them to exercise them, right? We don't want to, you wouldn't run a marathon and try to hold your breath at the same time. You, it, it, you can't work that way, right? So our neurons don't work that way. So we have to make sure that blood flow to our head is stable and strong before we initiate that neuro rehab. So we have to take all of these things into account at the same time. So to give an example of that, we had, we had a, uh, a gentleman, he's a 28 year old fellow, um, and he had, he had an injury and had been to a lot of places trying to figure out because it seemed like a lot of the symptoms were vestibular. So doing vestibular work and making that system run really well it didn't really change the symptoms. He had this elevated heart rate in this fog and the inability to interact in the world. 
And he was getting this, you know, like 30 point change in his heart rate just from standing up. But the vestibular work didn't really solve it. Like the vestibular stuff got better, but it didn't solve it. And then vision therapy, same thing. Physical therapy, same thing. And then what we looked at was this relationship of head movement and realizing that just simple movements of the head actually caused arrhythmias in the heart and causes caused cardio acceleration. So the heart would beat faster just from moving the head around, even though we weren't changing his position. Um, so this was really telling for us. And, and looking at this coordination helped us understand where we wanted to aim. So we did things that were relative to improving joint mechanoreception and then the ability to create passive ranges of motion and then active and then coordinating that with head and eye movements, and coordinating that with limb movements. And we saw really quickly that the heart rate responses came back down to normal. And then he could move his head without having these cardio acceleration moments. And then we could put him on a tilt test and his heart rate wouldn't go up. And he had more energy and he could sleep and then he could start to think. And this happens all, all really quickly, which is beautiful. But it gives us this window into understanding how this whole thing works together. So before you look at this and go, sweet, my neck hurts, <laughs> I got tachycardia, I'm just gonna start ripping some neck exercises and hope things go well. Maybe that would work, but maybe it also might not. <laughs> um, hopefully what you're seeing is that if you can look at all these things together, you may find you do have a stiff neck, but that stiff neck may be coming from a problem in your inner ear, or it may be coming from a problem with your eyes. So being able to look at them all together and how they interface and how they all work as a system. And then putting that in the context of what is happening with the autonomic system is a very, very rich way of understanding it. And it gives us a lot of therapeutic options that help us to be able to solve these problems forward. So I hope that's helpful. I hope it gives you some ideas if you're dealing with this or if, or if you're a practitioner and you're working with this. Hopefully it can expand that view and we can start to put these things together in a way that's super meaningful and we can really start to make big changes for people that have neck problems and autonomic problems together. So I hope that helps. Please leave a comment, give us some feedback, subscribe, like do all the interactive things that help us understand what's going on and we'll see you next time. Thanks.